Part 4. America, 1883. The American Cities Since 1790, every decade has been marked with the census of our largest cities. We were, for that period, a growing nation, and by 1850 the number of cities covered had expanded to 100. Since the Civil War, we have had one single census in 1870. This was the last year that the systems required to conduct such a survey were in place. This is, as you may have correctly learned, because our cities are now overrun by the Wendigo. Let us look at the numbers gathered on that last census for only the ten most populated areas. New York, 942,000. Philadelphia, 679,000. Brooklyn, 396,000. St. Louis, 310,000. Chicago, 298,000. Baltimore, 267,000. Boston, 250,000. Cincinnati, 216,000. New Orleans, 191,000. And San Francisco, 149,000. The grand total was just shy of 3.7 million bodies, with 90 more cities on the list. As anyone who was there when the outbreaks first occurred will know, the panic and chaos that gripped each one of those cities was biblical in magnitude. Great swathes of refugees fled to the west, the infected dug in and nested, and the streets became a lawless, godless, desolate ruin. Many fleeing trains of refugees encountered waves of the infected on their way through, and thus added to the seemingly ceaseless tide. It is impossible to tell how many lost their lives around the period between 1872 and 1880, or how many succumbed to infection and joined the ranks of the Wendigo. It is, however, possible to extrapolate from census count the scaling severity of events based on population concentration and surmise that the most densely populated city of New York is now the biggest nest of Wendigos in our nation, and on a sliding scale downward from there, a likely similar case for every city that has not yet been reclaimed. They do not stay confined. In fact, the creatures radiated out from each human settlement and into the surrounding countryside, as the circular ripples left by stones tossed in a mill pond. Like all natural predators, they roam close to the meat. However, despite numerous wide-ranging individuals, the nests appear to be within the cities, and it is to these that they return. We are looking now at a largely rural human population, divided into scattered pockets and settlements, that have managed to hold out for up to eleven years against the creatures along with disease, famine, and assault from other animals, hostile Indians, and the multitudes of nomadic private militias that have sprung up over the years. Make no mistake, the cities are the key to our national future. We cannot live alongside these creatures as brothers. Their infectious bodies make them too much of a long-term threat. In time, every man, woman, and child breathing air today will succumb without two vital actions. Cooperation and counterattack. Quite simply, if we do not cooperate, we will not find the strength to survive. If we do not counterattack and claim back our cities, whilst at the same time exterminating this threat to our very existence, then we will cease to be human. Everything mankind has achieved in his span on this earth will be for nothing. The Wendigo will prowl through our houses 
our fields, our graveyards, never understanding how important they were to the people now gone. The Battle of Washington In 1875, when the infection reached Washington, D.C., despite a desperate struggle for control, the city was abandoned in the tumultuous months that followed. There were heavy casualties in the government itself, and the survivors regrouped in the nearby city of Manassas. President Ulysses S. Grant, already a seasoned military leader, having commanded the Federal Union Army to eventual victory during the Civil War, made retaking the District of Columbia a priority, and by March 1880 had assembled a suitably sized military force to do so. Grant's army marched the 40 miles towards the capital, eradicating the Wendigo as they went, to find themselves facing some 13,000 creatures, roughly one-tenth of the city's population prior to infection. Having carefully assessed this amassed Wendigo infestation over the interim five years, Grant had surmised that we would need two men for every creature, each one trained specifically in how to dispatch them. His army numbered 26,142, just over a quarter of the force he had commanded 17 years previously at Gettysburg. Unlike that battle, the largest fought on American soil, where the Confederate force of over 70,000 men suffered heavy losses equating to 23,000 killed or wounded, this was a fight that could leave no survivors on the opposing side. We could not expect our enemy to surrender, and we could not let him flee. Every bite-related injury sustained by our troops counted as another victory for the Wendigo, and another arduous, heartbreaking execution for us. Many who sustained bites fought on valiantly, often for several hours, alongside their comrades, taking with them as many creatures as they could before meeting their noble end. Such was the resolve of the fighting American at this battle. They fought not for ideology or freedom, politics or flags, but for the continuance of our species. On May 12th, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue was secured, and the last of the Wendigos had been rooted out and eliminated. On that day, the American armed forces numbered 18,293. The names of the 7,849 who gave their lives adorned the wall of a black Washington War Memorial. They will never be forgotten as long as this nation stands. It is a casualty number too high to repeat again. We believed ourselves prepared as we went in, but no one could have fully anticipated the impact of that bloody conflict. It is our intention to take back every U.S. city by the end of the century, using what we learn each time to bring down this percentage. It will not rid us of the nomadic, wandering creatures on the plains, but the symbolic victory of reclaiming our homes will give us a powerful stronghold to return to each time, the better to range from to rid ourselves of those that remain. Our experience and expertise in this process as a unified military force will result in a land free of the Wendigo, a land for our children, a land of the future. In 1881, President Grant declared the onset of the Reclamation War, an endeavor of mass cooperation and mobilization the likes of which this world has never seen. The ultimate end being to wrest our nation back from the frenzied grip of the Wendigo, but also to repair the damage wrought for so many years and to make us whole once more. Nathaniel Curtis, General of the Reunified States Army, 
Washington, D.C., November 1880. I'm able to count myself among those who managed to walk away from the battle at Shiloh in April 1862. Of the 44,000 Confederate men who stepped up on that first day, one in four would be dead by the close of the next, which bore witness to our retreat. I remember vividly the horrors I saw on the field strewn with dying and dead on that first evening. Peach blossoms settled upon the bodies of Confederate and Union alike. It would have seemed almost peaceful to anyone unable to hear the screaming. Due to the nature of our weaponry and the frequent breakdown in tactics, it was commonplace for a conflict to descend into a sea of heaving bodies, beating one another to death in the mud. Our uniforms so obscured by filth that it was often impossible to tell if the man you were fighting was of the opposing ethos. In truth, so many of the men in those fields were unified in their deep longing for home and the loved ones they were fighting for, that politics, territories, the path of history faded to a dull roar. You simply survived or you did not. Pitching up in Manassas some fourteen years later, a battalion of southern fighters under my hastily organized command, I recognized shadows of that battlefield unity amongst the assembled survivors. While some made trouble and dug up old borderlines and grudges which impeded our passage, I was gratified that the majority simply laid down the ugliness of the past in the face of a new enemy that threatened to engulf us all. The next few years were based solely on assembly and preparation, gathering soldiers from all nearby corners of the surrounding states, fending off attacks from the creatures, and fortifying our positions. More and more former Yankee soldiers found themselves not only under my command, but putting their faith in an old enemy. I have often found benefit in quiet and calm determination, over jingoistic flag waving as a means of inspiration. I also find this leads me to not overcompensate for the very real misgivings I have on a regular basis. Some leaders hide their weaknesses from those who follow, striving to appear as a paragon. I cannot relate to a paragon. They occupy a space in a man's mind best left for other products of fiction. No man is without fear, and the ones who are truly frightened me. And so I found myself commanding the entire reunified state's army as we marched upon the District of Columbia. I know why I was appointed and why I retain that position today. 26,142 men have been trained for years against live Wendigos, but in nothing like the numbers we faced. The head of the army divided out and scoured through the streets in regimented processions. Many had expected that they would rush out to meet us in a vast wave, something we could once again throw our bodies against, flowing down 14th Street as some enormous fluid organism of charging savages. We had prepared for this with various firing line drills designed to dispatch them in stages before they reached us, using our ranged weaponry and their lack of it to our advantage. It was not like that at all. They are not mindless. They will not throw themselves at a group. Each one acted to preserve its own life, not in some highly coordinated fashion, but through innate instinct. We would experience sudden ambushes from above and below. Men venturing through doorways would find rooms swarming with them. Young deer and cattle and horses and other animals roamed the now overgrown streets, yet from the remains we found in every hollow and alcove, it was clear they were also feeding off one another. We were in their hunting ground. They would hide and strike, and when we were off guard and retreating, the attacks would be redoubled as they sensed our moments of weakness. Often in the panic, men would be clipped by our own gunfire, and the soldiers shrewdly resorted to close-range combat to limit this. Far too many were bitten and infected in the melee. Back during the Civil War, there was something called the Rebel Yell. This was inspired by a similar whooping that the American Indian brought with him to battle. 
started at the pit of your stomach and erupted out of you in effigy of a fox hunting yip, borne up in a corkscrew motion to culminate in the screeching cacophony of a cougar. It was, to the Yankees, quite terrifying to hear caterwauling from amid the trees as the Confederate forces closed in. We did this to break the spirits and indeed freeze the tracks of our quarry. As it happens, there can be few men or women alive who have not heard the call of the Wendigo. That harsh bark and screech that sets the hairs on the back of your neck near permanently aloft. I must now ask you to imagine that cry echoing round the dark and ruin of a library or municipal building, and in turn being caught up and joined by dozens, hundreds, sometimes a thousand more, the deafening shrieks emanating from every great, every burned-out archway, every awning. I speak to men daily who will ask that that sound never be made around them, not even in jest. The rebel yell was a device we employed as a group to control our own fear. Now we must hold our tongues and bide the silence, the better to control the situation. This cry of the Wendigo has been turned on us. But this was not a swift defeat. It was a slow victory. And over the months it took to root out every creature, the men and women of the reunified army adapted to and met the onslaught with bravery and equal cunning. Every night we pulled out from the city to rest and recuperate, staving off the likelihood of a nighttime attack. Those came nonetheless, but by them we were prepared and in fortified positions, sleeping in shifts and keeping watch on the city limits. Every morning, freshly rested units would re-infiltrate the city with rear guard groups, clearing and disposing of bodies. We adopted new tactics to compensate for the initially unexpected. Specialized units were formed with weapons shortened and muffled to dispose of indoor and underground infestations. The truly starving Wendigos were some of the hardest to manage. Their ferocity interrupted the processes that tell a body it has been damaged. Those were situations whose outcomes involved far too much spread of infection, as the creatures behaved in the manner of rabid hounds, no longer seeking sustenance or safety. For some who were bitten or otherwise infected, victory for the Wendigo would not be conceded easily. They fought on, and made the most use of themselves that they could with their final hours. A new, posthumously awarded medal has been commissioned for exactly this valorous act that exceeded previous lines of service. The Grave Duty Medal of Honor, adorned with a distinctive embossed red enamel shield. This reinforces the good that a man can do with his life and reminds their families and all who remember them that even in the paralyzing grip of fear of a now certain death, anyone can make a difference with their further actions, no matter how small. This is why I freely admit my misgivings. A man without fear has nothing to lose, but also nothing to fight for. It is the bravery required to overcome that fear that makes a soldier, or indeed any person, truly admirable. By degrees we beat them back, but not without sustaining heavy casualties. By April the numbers had thinned substantially enough that it became relatively safe to occupy. I recall a man being brought to me who had been discovered dug in on the upper floors of a hotel. He had held out there for six years, hunting and surviving. His complexion was scarred and pockmarked. Unfortunately, his mind had gone. Four white scarves were killed, bringing him in. Looking into his sunken eyes, gazing out of a face buried in the wild, unkempt hair of an entirely uncivilized man, I saw the future of our nation, should we not manage to band together. Few would survive, and at such a cost, that any worth in doing so would be swallowed up in unhappy consequence. From an old journal belonging to this man, I determined that his name was Clam. I told Clam he no longer had to fight, 
and that he could rest. We hoped to learn as much of the Wendigo as we could from his experience, but he died that very night, and only his earlier journal entries comprise enough of the last of that man he was to illuminate our enemy. I regret the loss of life this campaign entails, but I regret neither its course nor the striving for its ultimate goal. I hereby welcome all new recruits to our army. May you do a great courtesy to the memory of those who died winning back these years by likewise giving this war your every ounce of strength, determination, and courage. Duties as a Cartographer this is where you, the cartographers, as well as the assembled military ranks of the reunified states of America, come into play. With lines of communication cut between the myriad scattered settlements, we must work our hardest to re-establish that contact. Your duties as a cartographer are manifold. Traverse the distance between settlements. Map out the region, noting infestations. Make contact with each new community you locate. Recruit new members to the armed forces. Deal with smaller numbers of Wendigos. Make safe and reclaim the domiciles, farms, and towns. Broker negotiations with possible secessionists. And install telegraph communications. Let us look at each duty in turn. Traversal. What were once relatively safe routes from place to place have now become uncertain territories. Each scouting party heads up a wagon train of supplies with an army escort. You will consult existing maps and investigate previously inhabited areas to reassess the landscape and take appropriate action. Scouts will typically ride several miles ahead to detect dangerous situations, and if need be report back to the main unit if mobilization for attack, defense, or withdrawal is required. Mapping Our entire campaign is based on information, and the maps that you construct will allow us an overview of every region. We will need to know the approximate human population, and of any Wendigo infestations too large to be handled by the main unit. Also topographical assessments like fallen bridges, flooded areas, and quarantine zones. Most importantly, encountering those hostile to the reunified government is a deeply serious matter and must be handled with grave and steely resolve. If you come across a larger uprising, then military reinforcements may well be required. Contact when you find a settlement, you may be the first government agent they have met since the outbreaks. Even a small farm can make for a key outpost for defense, supplies, or recuperation. At this point, I must remind you that the people we are greeting may have been holding out for 11 years. They will in all likelihood not even have heard Washington was reclaimed, or the magnitude of the campaign that is now underway. To many of them, it will feel as though their government abandoned its people. As unsettling as this sounds, there's more than a grain of truth to it. We did focus on taking back Washington over the rest of the country. We took many years to muster the necessary forces required. Frequently, you will meet those with loved ones who died waiting for help. These can be the most wearing encounters on the soul, and you must focus on the ones we can now save over the countless thousands, we could not. You will need to show that we are now attempting to address our past decisions with the reunification this campaign represents, adding every new settlement's strength to the greater America. We are not raiders. Every group you meet is to be respected. This must not become a parade of government-sanctioned abuse. You are representatives of the reunified states, and that is an immense responsibility. Some will be on the brink of starvation. You must aid them in establishing new resources and support. This does not mean simply giving food off your wagon. It is an ongoing survival situation, and if they have lasted this long, 
than they already possess the wherewithal to organize a better supplied existence. They are our allies, and they are our people. Recruitment To take back the cities, we do not simply need manpower. In point of fact, we need everyone. Every single Wendigo out there. Regardless of their original body's classification, gender, or race. Male, female, young, old, Caucasian, African, Chinese. Every single one of them will pit themselves against us and fight to the death. They will spread their sickness wherever they are allowed to survive. Quite simply, every able body capable of lending a hand in the fight has a duty and must be given the opportunity to do so. This has been one of the hardest aspects for some settlements to comprehend. Some were lucky enough to be able to carry on much as they had before the Wendigo emerged with men and women performing the same hunting, cooking, cleaning and agricultural tasks as before. Now we are placing sabers and rifles in the hands of school moms, negroes, Chinamen, children as young as ten. If they can fire with some degree of accuracy, then why should they not be granted the role of riflemen? A key aspect of our survival is adaptability. If we fail to adapt to this newfound situation, bury our heads in the sand like the ostrich, if we cling to tradition and cultural persuasion as though it is the only form of existence, then that existence will be short-lived. Women must fight. Children must help. Former plantation owners must stand beside their former property in the same uniforms. Only with the dedication of the entire American populace can we succeed. Not everyone must fight all of the time. Agriculture, raising livestock and the mass production of easy-to-transport food and supplies are absolutely essential for feeding and sustaining the country. Experienced farmers are a precious resource and can perform duties that save thousands of lives, not to mention the amassed ranks of medical practitioners required for such a war. Children and those physically unable to fight can still serve in factories, crafting the munitions, weapons, clothing and equipment for the army. Not one person is of no use, so everyone must be located and given their task to perform. Eradication On your travels you will encounter the Wendigo constantly. It will become part of your daily life. You will never let this make you complacent or cocksure. Approach each situation with wary senses. Be ready to fight within one second every moment of the day. Do not fight more than you can handle as a unit. You heard about the damage a single Wendigo can do to even a trained military party. Understand them and never underestimate their cunning. Reclamation over time, each unit will become more accomplished at clearing out the farms, homesteads, and small townships you encounter. Each becomes an outpost and goes on the map. We can win this fight, if every resource is accounted for, and safe areas are clearly accessible and readily defensible. The amount of supplies that can be salvaged varies greatly with each domicile. But virtually everything can be used to further these efforts. Weapons and ammunition can be cleaned, maintained, and added to the military arsenal. Food can be stored appropriately and used to feed our troops and workers. However, we must be fair with all rationing. Every man, woman, and child must have enough to survive. Clothing can be repurposed into uniforms as the standard blues of the Union Army is still the garb of the American soldier, many Confederate uniforms have been dyed Prussian and sky blue to match these, and other garments found can often be sent to outposts to provide necessary protection from the elements for those who have had to repair and maintain the same clothing for a decade. 
Gold and silver, along with all other metals, have no monetary value anymore. Now the RSA has adopted the barter system. However, they are all materials to be used in the making of weapons, uniforms, and equipment for the military, along with leather for boots, belts, and coats. Bear in mind that this is what we salvage from deserted domiciles. I reiterate that we are not and cannot be raiders. If people want to donate their possessions, that is a choice for them alone. We will not win this fight breaking hearts and spirits. Quite the contrary. Negotiation. As mentioned above, some will be hostile. I will not be facetious with the truth. In this line of work, you will be shot at. It is your duty to respond rationally and proportionally. If you cannot bring them in or persuade them to lay down arms through negotiations or a relatively non-fatal firefight, then reinforcements may be necessary. Remember, every man you kill is one less soldier by your side when we take the cities. Many will not see the essential nature of our national cooperation. They will cling to independence and survival of the fittest. This is understandable after years of having to make do on their own. Couple this, however, with eleven Confederate states bearing deep scars and resentment, mourning fathers and brothers, perceiving their property, land, and let us not forget, slaves to have been taken from them, then left to their own devices, and you have a very distinct possibility of a forceful coalition in opposition to the reunified states. You will find hate, burn and prejudice, and resistance to change that borders on self-destruction. These are all aspects of human existence that must be dealt with carefully and accordingly with both patience and stern resolve. You must be ready to kill, but conversely you must always be looking to spare the lives of those who threaten our campaign. We cannot win this fight if we destroy ourselves in the process. This, of course, also means brokering accords with the natives of this land, the American Indian. In an occurrence of supreme irony, the families we considered savage for centuries and have been engaged in bitter territorial warfare with now stand as either deadly enemies or powerful allies against the true savages. This may turn the stomachs of many who read it, but I implore you to consider the broader canvas. When the Wendigo first emerged, and the white settlers fled their cities, they found themselves in similar nomadic circumstances to the native people, living off the land and defending themselves against attack on a regular basis. We were at our weakest. A unified effort on the parts of the many tribal peoples could easily have wiped us off the map of the East. But they did not do this. They largely left us alone and defended their own borders, adapting to this new enemy. It is time for us to live and indeed fight side by side. If reasoned with carefully, even the most aggressive of tribes will see the benefit of not leaving their Caucasian neighbors to be turned by the Wendigo swarm, and should, if they are shrewd warriors, aid us in pushing back the tide. Communication Finally, a major advantage that, if implemented properly, will win us this war. The system of telegraph lines established in America from 1844 through to the early 1870s, has been damaged and left in disrepair in many areas, blocking communication over wide distances. If we are to succeed, we must be able to talk with one another. One of the teams being escorted by every army unit will be dedicated to re-establishing this contact, repairing the lines and setting up communication stations with every significant outpost. This will allow us to relay messages in hours rather than days or weeks and save countless lives and resources, which would otherwise be spent engaging in dangerous and lengthy traversal. Plans are afoot to supersede this technology without the requirement of wiring. When this is achieved, we shall truly have the upper hand on our primitive animalistic foe.
duties as a soldier. The duties of the army are less complex, but absolutely vital for the fight. Without these men and women, our species has already lost. Train new recruits. Deal with larger groups of Wendigos. Make safe and reclaim the cities. Eradicate domestic enemies to quell uprising. Training. All new recruits will need to be fully schooled in the dispatching of the Wendigo and the Secessionist, two very different forms of battle. Both are as serious and necessary to our nation's future as any armed conflict you could cite from mankind's history. There will be weapon and tactical specialization based on aptitude and ability. These will not be disposable troops, the common label of the farmer with the rifle. They must instead be sharp-eyed marksmen, efficient killers with blade and club, capable of survival at the toughest of times when most men would break. They face an enemy that the world has not seen before, and only by being the best at doing precisely this will humanity persist. Many newcomers will have been hardened by years of survival and will understand the nature of these creatures already. Even before the Wendigo surfaced, our nation had to live through difficult and trying times. Some will be veterans of the Civil War, now tempered by the same years of survival. They are to be afforded yet more respect for offering up their lives for their country, their God and their families, not once, but twice. And this next part I must make plain. This conflict, I say again, defies politics and ideology. We will not judge or condemn, but thank all who step up to the line, whichever side they fought on. We are all to be brothers once again, and this time it shall be beside one another. Eradication. The Wendigo must be destroyed. It is that simple. Our army is the force we will use to achieve this. Our support networks will be what keep everyone alive while this is achieved. Reclamation. As with the District of Columbia, so shall it eventually be with every other city in the RSA. Over the next few years, we aim to spread out over the eastern states and establish lines of communication. Safe areas. Newly inhabitable towns. Farmlands. Factories. Defensible forts and chains of supply to maintain our military, industrial, and agricultural contingents. As we go, we will recruit more and more people to the reunified states. We will spread that most precious of commodities. Genuine hope for the future. Among them. And they will fight all the fiercer. The cities will be cleared, the countryside scoured, and eventually, life, human life, will return. At present, the established order for taking back the major cities begins with Baltimore, the neighbor to the east of D.C. From there we will head south, freeing Atlanta, to prove that this is an America for all of us, not just those who sided with the Union. Nashville will follow, then New Orleans, Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, and Milwaukee. In the north, we will take back Ohio, with Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati, followed by Detroit. The final push will be east towards the coast of Maine, moving through Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, New York, Brooklyn, Newark, and Buffalo, until finally only Boston remains. This will be one of the hardest periods, with the most densely packed and dangerous areas, but we will push and push, and continue to do so until we drive the Wendigo into the Atlantic Ocean. It will be many years before we can watch the sunrise in Boston, but when we do, this nation will truly be able to call itself free, 
and we will have done so with the greatest that mankind has to offer. Quelling Secession, in this case, is even more of a serious matter than throughout the Civil War. While the fiercely sought independence many of our detractors hold to may be admirable in certain lights, what they are plainly saying with this rebellion is the following. I will not join the fight to save America from the Wendigo. I will murder any man who tries to make me. These are people who may see absolute validity in their reasons for fighting us, but we cannot allow them to take even one soldier from our ranks, either on ideological grounds or through a criminal act of murder. If these people are left to their own devices, their self-centered plan for their own continued existence will spread to others, and it will lead everyone who follows it to a horrifying end by tooth and claw, as the ratio of humans to wendigos in their region tips inexorably away from humanity. Those who are turned maintain their opposition to us, but in doing so become creatures that can turn others, and in this an all too obvious pattern is formed. Both wendigos and secessionists are now beings whose existence in a closed system, separate from our own, will be quite acceptable, making them harmless to the human race. But in today's landscape, Given our do-or-die campaign of every man, woman, and child in America pitted against every Wendigo inhabiting our land, they represent infectious clusters that will weaken our abilities to respond. Therefore, secession that cannot be resolved with fair negotiation must be met with swift, unyielding force until it like the Wendigo, is eradicated. Part 5. Combat and Survival Accounts from the Field Here you will find first-hand experiences of members of the Reunified States Army and cartographer scouts. As with the rest of this book, they are included to better illuminate the situations you will be facing. Tabitha Chorley, Lewistown, Pennsylvania, January 23rd, 1882. As a bone collector, my task is one of the less pleasant to carry out, and even discuss, from the range of professions available to an American woman in 1882. All of the towns, villages, and settlements we pass through, if not occupied by humanity, must be cleared. Often this means dispatching the Wendigo population residing there. If that is the case, then the remains we find of the former residents are, in no uncertain terms, a congregation of bones. It is my task, with the men and women under me, to go house to house, room to room, cellar to attic, to gather the dead. If they died in hiding, we must find them. If they represent the leavings of the Wendigo, we must sweep them up. After the bodies are all found and accounted for, we collect them in pits at the outskirts of town and see to it that they are buried and consecrated so that their souls may find peace. The bodies of the Wendigos are treated somewhat differently. We know for sure that their souls left them some time ago, along with the last of their humanity, and they are gathered in identical pits, burned and buried, located far from the town and out in the wild, lest their infection somehow seep into the soil. Upon the stones set at the mass graves, we simply etch the name of the settlement, there is no ferreting out of identities and attributing them to the dead. It became too complex an issue, differentiating between those turned and those consumed, and on occasion, both. 
It also weighed far too heavily on those around me to sift through their belongings and imagine each person alive and well, only then to be forced into reckoning upon the circumstances of their death. Too many stories, too much truth. We have enough sadness of our own without bearing the burdens of the strangers whom we meet, now departed. I am asked why God would do this. Why does he punish us so? Where I was born in Sharpsburg, we were raised to love him and praise his name. Everywhere I walk now, I meet more who fear and even curse him. If this is his will, how can we feel any different? I have known folks simply lay down and never wake. So hopeless was their vision of our future. I decided, lest I lie down and give up too, to take the word of those who say he is testing us. I do not know to what end, but I have an inkling. On occasion, I have had the rare opportunity to return to towns I have formerly cleared, and which have been resettled with refugees, grateful for a roof over their heads after years of rootless wandering. The chimney smoke, the smell of cooking stoves, the sound of playing children, born in the Wendigo years, the candles at the window sill, the smiles of those who know what my company and I had to do in order to provide their new home. That is one more step to my passing his test. Corporal Ryan Considine, Mayfield, Ohio, June 3rd, 1881. It is sure and true that the Wendigo can kill you all right, but it's merely the one holding the baton at the head of the marching band of nature stretching back into our history. Fact is, everything can kill you out here, and most of it's actively attempting to do so with every minute of the day. The cold can kill you, as most will know by now, swiftly and with a numbing surety. Water can kill you, whether it be in a foolish attempt to cross vast expanses or creeks you aren't sure of the depth of, running down the back of your neck, the damp, the rot. Water and cold together conspire to end your life in unpleasant and foul-smelling ways, bringing with them diseases and all sorts of infections. The sun can kill you. A man without a hat or access to shade and water in the boiling heat of South Carolina is liable to go mad before he drops. Bears can kill you. They also kill several of your companions for good measure. Mountain lions, packs of wolves, everything that moves. I once saw a private sit down on a tree stump to shake the stones out his boots and propped himself up on a pile of dried leaves. He left up screaming and kicking. Turned out it was a rattlesnake had been curled up in them leaves. He hadn't heard the rattle over the sound of the men around him until it was too late. He lost the arm and later died of infection within three days. My brother's unit was clearing through towns down near Richmond and found a place strew with bodies. The corpses were less emaciated than were found in a lot of settlements that had been stricken with starvation. They even found food in the storehouses. Turned out it was smallpox and the entire unit had to be quarantined. Four made it out alive. My brother Tom, however, God rest his soul. 
At least with the Wendigo, you know you're on even terms. It can kill you, but you can stick a knife into its guts. Better yet, a bullet in the forehead before it gets to you. No man, however, can banish the cold, the rain, the burning sun, sickness, despair. A man can only guard against them and pray he's done his best. Corporal Harriet Blaine, Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, November 24th, 1881. In a small settlement in Pennsylvania, our party came across a sorry situation that I speak of now in order to cultivate understanding of the actions of desperate people. The defences of the town were primed and guarded against our encroachment, and I distinctly recall a moment of unbearable tension when it seemed like we would be granted neither entry to impart news of the outside world, nor be given leave to return to the main group. It was, in fact, only the actions of my lieutenant, who very slowly, announcing his every move as he did so, placed every weapon he had upon him on the ground, and walked with deliberation and utmost calm, with arms raised and palms open to meet their leader. There was some discussion, and I avoided the eyes of the men and women with rifles trained upon me. Instead, I fixed myself to my purpose of aiding and informing the pockets of survivors we would continue to meet. Lieutenant Williamson then beckoned me over, and we sat with a small group of them. They accounted for many years of isolation and fear, fending off multiple Wendigo attacks and trying unsuccessfully for a long while to make the land more agreeable to growing vegetables and grain. Harsh winter and blight along with the Wendigo's obliteration of the majority of the nearby livestock had made a feeding of the town people a mean exercise. When in 1876, 17 of their number were dead but not yet in the ground, the meeting was held. It was here that a man I will not name first put forward the idea of sustaining the living with the bodies of the dead. This information was revealed to us with not undue shame and open weeping. I could tell from Williamson's face that this was as hard for him to bear as it was for me. Some years before, my natural inclination would have been to snatch up my revolver and end the life of as many of these abominable creatures as I could. It was bad enough to have our minds and bodies violated by the sickness of the Wendigo, a being intent on feeding on the very humans whose species it previously shared, but for rational men and women to take this step, even under duress, would have been near incomprehensible for me. However, I was now older and had seen many horrors. Gazing into the sorrowful eyes of these people, who had been through so much hardship, death and sacrificing of standards and ethics, my younger vengeful fires were quashed. A naughty situation was upon us. If we acquitted the townspeople of all crimes, and especially if these events were recorded, would we be sending out the message, quite horrific in its nature, that it was an acceptable course of action to eat human flesh in trying times? Recalling the words of Director Arlington, I surmised that the myth of the Wendigo was begun by the Indians to make this very crime an unforgivable sin. On the other hand, if, feigning compliance, we were treated to the safety of our ranks and sent in a contingent of soldiers to wipe these cannibals from the face of the earth, would that rob us of potential allies? Not to mention any soldiers who might perish in the fray. Would that simply be sanction and murder? Were the children just as guilty as the adults? Where did the line lie between abominable crime and desperate measure? Lieutenant Williamson and I discussed this in safety far from the settlement. We agreed that we could neither abandon them to the elements they had been prey to for years, nor leave this incident unaddressed. As we considered how hard they had tried to keep themselves alive, 
without resorting to their eventual crime. The solution presented itself. The town would be granted a very specific and apt redemption. Not one of these people would be drafted as a soldier. All would instead become medical trainees and agricultural workers. With years of hard graft, they might eventually save enough lives in battlefield medical bays and through the cultivation of food for the hungry American people to square them with the Almighty in an effort to win their soul's salvation and entry into heaven. The cost of human life is simply too precious now to haphazardly dole out judgments of death. In the fall of this year, I received a bullet to the leg from a bandit group around the James River in Lynchburg. I later learned that the man who saved my leg was from the Pennsylvania settlement. Now, whenever I hit a jaunty stride, I reflect on my first dark inclination, and thank God I did not follow up on it. Captain Annie Oakley, Missouri, January 1879 Every so often you will come across a place that has managed to make things work. It is a rare thing, and should not only be preserved, but held to shining example for the rest of the world. A great deal of this depends on the placement of the area survivors have settled in. Usually they are remote enough not to have been flooded with wandering refugees seeking any port in a storm secluded enough not to have attracted attention from nomadic gangs that move through our land, stripping away everything of value. And nearly always they will be peopled with small numbers of eminently practical and adaptable folk. The double bind of this is that the more inhospitable the area, the harsher the climate and the more difficult to harvest the land of resources, the less people will flock to it and the more isolated it will remain. This means a delicate balance of elements with human ingenuity to bring them all to fruition, and I confess the places I have come across that fit this tall order are scarce indeed. One such place, which I will remind readers of a covetous disposition, has a fully armed and fortified garrison nearby, was in Mattawa, Ontario. I was in one of the parties that traveled northwards to search for possible retreats for the American people. The remote location, coupled with cooperation from and trade with the Algonquin Aboriginals, had allowed a small fishing colony to thrive in that area. Any and all sightings of the Wendigo were followed up on and dedicated hunting teams were sent out to track them down. We stayed with this group for some time before pressing on, eventually returning to emplace the military outpost. What I found most heartwarming was the acceptance that existed in this camp. Though many had pitched up there after bearing witness to the horrors of the panic in our cities, fear had not taken hold of them. They simply took the Wendigo as another element that they must react to with corresponding vigor in order to survive. They had woven the creatures into the fabric of their day. They were not waiting for rescue or salvation. This was simply life moving on, just as it always had. This instilled in me the hope that one day, despite the trials behind and ahead of us, we can, as a nation, consider ourselves a people able to weather the worst and survive with body, mind, and heart intact.